ladies and gentlemen, right to your host of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Hello and welcome to the ninth season of Down the Garden Path where each week we discuss our down-to-earth tips and advice while doing our best to help you seasonally manage your garden and landscape. I'm Joanne Shaw, owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design, and with me is my co-host and co-author, Matthew Dressing. Hello, Joanne and everyone else. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. And no, you're not just everyone else. You're our dedicated listeners, and we love you. I'm Matthew Dressing, owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. As landscape designers and gardeners, we believe it's important and possible to have great gardens which are sustainable and low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. That's right. And with spring only a couple of weeks away, we hope, and (laughs) although it's not quite time to head outside with our plants, like us, they can tell us the days are growing longer. They can tell, not us. They can tell the days are growing longer. (laughs) This means it'll soon be time to transplant, propagate, and prune our indoor jungle. Tonight, we're discussing some spring houseplant care tips to keep your collection looking fresh. Do you have questions about your houseplants? And we know you do based on last week's show. Are you growing something cool and unusual that you'd like to share with everyone? Tell us about it or send us a picture. Write us at downthegardenpathpodcast at hotmail.com. And don't forget to stick around for the end of the show for our new Stepping Stone segment, where we will answer more listener questions and give you timely tips for your garden and landscapes. Exactly. Yes, the email lines are open. I know everybody has lots of questions yes. about their house plants. What about you? Do you grow many house plants yourself? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, first, I want to give a shout out to our listeners about last week's show on terrarium. So lots of great feedback, right, Matt, during the show. Yeah. Several people sent pictures of their terrariums. Um, who was it? Andrew found a kit online. Um, yes. I meant to post that in the Facebook group. So I'll do that. I posted several of the other pictures um, that listeners sent us in the Facebook group. Uh, so go there and check it out. Um, so yeah, it was it was a just a really great topic, and I've had a couple people talk to me afterwards that listened to it as a as a podcast and said it was a great episode. So so that's exciting, and yeah, I back to what I grow. I grow mishmash of things um, in my <laughs> office right now. I have I'm a sucker for the tiny orchids. Um, I just think they bloom so much longer than the big orchids and I don't know I really like them and because I put one in my terrarium that I made a couple weeks ago I had to you know when I was at Conan I had to buy another one so I have (laughs) a new new one I also have a tiny um, tiny and it's going to be pink when it flowers um, African violet oh Uh, yes it's it's got a white edge to the leaves and they're like really tiny so you can see there Oh, yeah. And I have a couple of jade plants, actually. Um, and uh, what else do I have here? Oh, I have a Chris. I don't know which kind of cactus it is. I don't know if it's not blooming, so it doesn't look like it's an Easter cactus. Um, <laughs> so that is in my window right now in my office. Of course, I have an air plant that we got from, uh, remember Dave's air plant show? And I bought this, and when I was at Con and I bought this cool little uh, uh, holder for it. So I'm really excited. So yeah, so around my house, I've got some pelagronias and um, rubber tree. So you know what? I have a rubber tree plant. So I've been married. This year will be 33 years. And my mom gave me a piece of her rubber tree plant when we got married. She no longer has it. And I have a huge, massive uh, rubber tree plant that is third, literally 33 years old. And so um, for me, anyway, I took some cuttings. I know it wasn't the time. I know you had said the time to take cuttings. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that in this show as well um, in the winter because I needed to move it out of the room. <laughs> we redecorated and I needed to get it out. So I did some cuttings and they did root. I think I rooted three. I had cut four and I think I lost. So I only lost one. One just completely defoliated. So I just don't think I... But the other three, I did root. So, yeah. But I still have the big plant that I'm just having hard because it grew very wide. 
Oh. It's not a single stem. It's like multi, like, you know, in the landscape design world or the outside world, it would be multi-stemmed. So, yes. it, it, you know, it was kind of like the, the third piece of furniture in my dining room between my dining room table, the hutch and the plant. Every, everybody else had to like make room. So, <laughs> it, uh, and it did that. Well, it grew in because that dining room was north facing. So it didn't get a ton of light. But so I think that's contributes to it was always reaching, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's always kind of stretching. And not that they don't like direct, direct sunlight, but yeah, that bright, indirect yeah. sunlight for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it never was a single stem like now. So whatever, however, my mom took a cutting, but, you know, 33 years ago, it never became a single. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, so which I didn't really know at the time back then. So now I do. So anyway, so yeah, so I have a I have an odd sort. How about you? I know you've got quite a few. I've got quite a few. So speaking about uh, the rubber plant, I've mm-hmm. actually got a, a variegated rubber plant. So I'm working on on that as I reach over because they're all, have some hand at all pink. Time. Oh yes, it's got some white. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. So you got to get that kind of trained. I've got a little bamboo stake. Um, just kind of trying to make a standard out of it, or more of a tree form Ooh, for okay. it. Yeah, we okay. saw that at the garden center, and it was really cool. As you were saying, you love the the mini orchids or the smaller orchids, and I agree. I like the littler one or the smaller ones too. Oh. Yeah, look, you've got one too. Yes, and yeah, we're so so for those of us who can't see us on Zoom. We'll I know, if, uh, unfortunately, our our listeners can't see us, but. Uh... Um, well, we can post some pictures of some of our, um, or I'll take a, a screenshot, hold it up and let's take a screenshot. Ah! Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to look um, at, join us on the Facebook group at down the garden path podcast and we'll show off some of our plant collection. Yeah. Our house plant collection. Yes. Yep. So, um, I, yeah. I'll, I always think of you because like my little orchid that I was just showing Joanne is like a rich kind of buttery golden yellow. With little bits of red on it and I know you really don't like yellow as far as a flower color goes yeah in the yeah. garden but that I really like though oh, that okay. was nice yeah that was pretty um and then yeah my uh Thanksgiving cactus is actually has just been sporadically sending out a couple of blooms so it's a nice um again like a creamy uh, yellow color and then it's got like a little red ring around its throat um so it's really pretty too so I gravitate kind of towards whites and yellows and maybe it's just ah. kind of a bright color spring yeah. indoors mm-hmm. do you have um do you have one because I know you've got lots of tabletop stuff like do you have a spot in in your apartment where you can have like one that's on the floor like a like a like a large like I Benjamina do. or something yeah I do but I've never I haven't filled that space yet I do yeah. and I've always wanted a massangina cane so those big, tall um, uh, corn plants. Oh, so they okay. Are, yeah. Oh, oh, no, I have a, I have a Dracaena behind me, right? That's the Dracaena. There's a right. fake Dracaena, and then there's a real Dracaena oh, in I my corner. I can't tell from here. <laughs> I cannot tell. You know what? I've always wanted a fig tree. Oh, like Stephen Biggs kind of fig tree? Uh, no, or... not necessarily the fruiting one. Uh, we do have a fruiting okay. one for outside, but the like the indoor plant fig tree. Right, right. Are they the same thing? You're going to tell me, did I embarrass myself? Or are they the no, same? No, 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 no. Yeah, there's okay. lots of different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of figs, I was thinking of Stephen Biggs the other day because I was up at um, a herbal, a garden center, not a well, garden center nursery near us. And I had to count, they had 24 different types of hardy figs. <gasps> that, yes, that they could, yes, it would take, yeah, it was unbelievable. So I thought, oh, maybe I would try one of those as well. But yes. Yeah. So there's tropical. There's the edible ones all in that group. Oh, you'll have to yeah. let me know where that was. Very interesting. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, yeah. So if for our listeners, so let us know what you are growing, what you'd love to try to grow. It's interesting. There's always trends, right, with plants, too. I know um, like succulents have been super, super big for a while. That, so yeah, I think you know when you you know that they're popular because there's fake ones in the stores. Uh, yes, that's very true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Succulents yeah. is definitely still growing strong, especially yeah. amongst 
new plant parents or seasoned plant parents. There's so many different cool colors and shapes and textures. And they're just so low maintenance, right? They yes. require very little or very infrequent watering compared to more of our foliage plants. Right, so right. As long as you have the right conditions, though, because I think I feel bad that, and I've done it too, right, where I bought them and I don't, ha- and I've done it, like I've, I've had kept them outside successfully, like on, mm-hmm. the, on the patio table or, or, or on the front steps. I put them in dish gardens and kind of had them like on the front steps as something uh, more of a visual interest and a, you know, conversation piece. And then bringing them inside, just to, I do not have the sun that they right. require to have it inside. So, um, but I was watching some propagation videos. So they really are kind of cool to propagate, aren't they? They really are very cool to propagate. Yes, yes. You can do a lot by seed, but propagating yeah. indoors is very easy as well. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about propagating actually for you, um, your uh, rubber tree. Have you ever tried air layering? it? I did a few years ago. Um, I just fought with the saran wrap and like it just didn't, nothing seemed to happen. Okay. You know what? Yeah. I'll have to, maybe I'll lend you one because I have a couple but they're little plastic shells that you can fill oh. with peat moss and then okay. they just snap together over top and there's a little hole so you can water it and keep the peat, uh, like the sphagnum moss, nice and moist and she'll just kind of do her thing over some time. Oh, I would like that. All right. So, and that would work for anything while we're on our topic for our listeners, any large yeah. house plant that you want to divide or to take cuttings from, maybe to share? Yeah, for the most part, if, especially if they're prone to air layering, a lot of things like, um, like you were saying, the, um, oh my gosh, I just totally blanked on what you just said, the rubber tree, thank you. The rubber tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and um, my Diefenbachia, okay. your other Dracaenas, those things with the, like the slender or fleshy canes, they yes. do very well because all of those little leaf scars are nodes and have some cells in there that will very okay. easily become uh, roots because they're under high concentration. So, okay. Yeah, they're very, very easy to but- do. Things that are woodier, like a Benjamina or, right, that and a corn plant, like that's fairly woody. So uh, air layering wouldn't work for that. Yeah, usually not. And okay. You want to take anyways the tips of, or like the newer season's growth while it's actively growing. So we would take more of like a soft wood cutting with a couple nodes and we might dip it into some rooting hormone and then we would uh, treat it as such and just kind of okay. put it in a moist area keep it evenly moist don't let it dry out mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay so as far as spring goes though there are some things that we should be doing right because I tend to be a, like I'll confess I usually am a pretty neglectful parent plant parent <laughs> like they got to <laughs> tough it out on their own for the most part um, so but there's some things that we should be doing this time of year yeah the main thing we like we were saying in the intro um, they notice that these days are getting longer um, and being warm inside, they're going to start to break dormancy and start to grow up. So one of the main things that we can do as we get into uh, late March or early April, or even now, depending on, on how many you've got and how uh, bound they are, but potting them up now is the best time to start moving them and potting them up. So we may not take them outside just yet. So if you do know you have some big ones, some larger indoor rubbers Mm -hmm. or mass and gina canes, you may have to wait a little bit. We may decide to wait. So it is easier to do it outside and keep it outside. Potting up is perfect now. So we can take them out of their pots. We can tease those roots. If you find that you've got some really thick, older, woody roots, we can do a root pruning as well. And so what that'll be is just taking out a third of all of the thicker roots. And this will encourage the tree or sorry, the house plant, maybe a tree. Um, We do the same with trees, but yeah. Yeah. And basically create those new fibrous root systems to kind of take over that pot again. When we do pot up, we don't want to move up very high in a pot unless we know we've got something very vigorous growing. Right. Um, But we really only want to go up about two inches. Okay. Because we want that plant to take the time to adjust from the transplant and slowly fill that area. Right. So like an eight inch pot to a 10 inch pot or 10 inch pot to a 12 inch pot. We don't want to go, you don't want to put an eight inch in a, in a 14 inch pot kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And you're thinking, oh, well, Mike, it's going to grow in there one day. And although that is true, what mm-hmm. happens is we tend to water it the same way we watered it before. And mm-hmm. that's by watering all the soil that's in the pot. And yeah. now almost half of your soil in a four, eight to a 14 
has nothing in it. So now that water just acts on the peat. We get some fungal or root rot issues occurring. Mm -hmm. And that just, yeah, overwaters the plant in general and kind of takes it for a turn. So okay. yeah. So, so Darlene has asked a perfect, perfect oh. timing with her question, Matt. She's asked, um, how do we know if we need to repot a pot, a plant? Does it show on the plant or the soil? How do you know? Yeah, Darlene, good question. So any plant, whether it's one of your seedlings or it's a house plant established, basically the rule is once the roots start to hit the edge of the pot and do a slight turn, it's time to go. So they're ready mm. to move up. But how can you see that though? You would have to, sorry, you, you would have to take it out of its pot. So okay. you, for example, if you're checking on your new tomato seedlings, you would take a few that you know are strong and healthy uh, and tip them over or pop them out of their plug. And as you see the roots just hitting the edge of the soil and starting to turn because it's hit the plastic or the edge of a okay. pot, if it's something bigger, we're ready to go. And that's where we can move up, up to two. Okay. Eventually, we are going to pot up to a point where we can't manage whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like your rubber plant. Like how yeah. big of a pot is it in now? It's, it is quite frankly probably too big of a pot. But yeah, it'd probably be a 14-inch pot. Like it's Yeah, it's, so you're it's a good probably size. not going to go up from there, right? Yeah. Right. So for yeah. you, because that's as big as someone might be able to manage in the house um, or at any time of the year, that's more where, you know, you take it out, you do some root pruning, rejuvenate yeah. the soil itself a little bit and then mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I just love to bring it in tighter kind of thing. Um, sometimes I feel like when you can't get the plant out of the pot, so maybe for like a smaller, yes. um, you know, cause even when you buy them at the nerd, you know, do you ever buy a new plant and you, and you go to pop, take it out of the plastic pot and put it into your pot and it's like, oh my God, it's really tight. And I did that with one of my, um, um, pathos this week I I like it didn't it really wasn't doing well and I had cut it back so it was really the the actual what was showing in the leaves was very small but I knew it, it had been in there a long time so I thought you know what I need to freshen up that soil and I was going to combine it with another one that was longer kind of put them together and I couldn't get it out of the pot so Darlene <laughs> I would say that's one thing is you know really if you can't get it out you know you've had a long time to take it out and kind of look at how root bound it is and then you know it's time but if you take it out because some things are slow growing and you might think geez i've had this a few years it must need it um like i think of um transcendentia mm -hmm. um they are their roots are, there's not a lot of root to them like even the plant gets big but there really isn't a lot of root right yeah so just like some trees right you know and shrubs they will have smaller root systems yes and they they might have a big mass up top but they don't really need as much room in below and then the opposite is true as well right with things like our uh, uh oh my gosh thanksgiving cactus and the easter cactus they usually grow in smaller tighter spots so they don't really need to be constantly potted up a little bit of root bound or tightness uh, in a small container is good thing. Same thing with uh, our Phalaenopsis orchids we were showing each other, right? They're mm. epiphytic. They tend to grow attached to things or in very small pockets of things. So depending on the plant as well, you may not need to be potting it up completely as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. some of that little bit of root bound as well. Mm -hmm. And you were saying too about pulling the pot out. One of my yes. first thoughts is if you have a very squat or oval pot, um, so like it, it's not just straight up and down on the edges. Yes, that's it happened to me too. Yes. Out. Yes. Yeah. And then you have to either break it or hack at the roots to kind of get it out. Yeah. yeah. So if you have one of those pots, um, check on it regularly uh, yes. or fill that side with something that uh, it doesn't allow it to grow in there or use okay. it as a pot cover as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, quick, just to pop back to the orchids. So maybe you don't need to upgrade the pot size, but because it's, it's um quote unquote soil, which is fairly like loose and barky and mossy, right? It's not a typical um, house plant. Uh, mm. Maybe it needs to stay in the same pot, but maybe you need to refresh that soil, right? And I know I have a bag of orchid. They call it soil, but it's really not like or orchid bark mixed with some smeg smegna moss. Um, it, is that a good idea? Yeah, you could definitely check on the health of your orchid, pop it out prune any dead roots that might be right in the bottom. And then like you said, yeah, it's not really a soil technically because they're not terrestrial. The ones that we were showing the Phalaenopsis are 
terrestrial orchids and right. a lot of the ones that are all of the ones almost that you see in garden centers especially up here are not terrestrial orchids so they tend to have um or they're somewhat epiphytic they mm. tend to have more of a, a like a composty type bark mm -hmm. or, or soil media soil being loose yeah soil media to mimic kind of that debris that has fallen or uh, you know blown around or caught at the base so i would think of like the phalaenopsis growing in the sides of trees and they're on trees and things right that's leaf debris and other stuff that's blown down and caught in and that it's mm -hmm. taking advantage of yeah so okay. yeah it's not necessarily soil so yes. remember a technical soil um, especially just thinking about like house plants and things like that our typical soil is a mixture of sand silt and clay uh, particles in a percentage much like outdoor garden soil yes yeah, yeah. but our indoor yeah. soils are all soil less so you right. may have a little bit of sand but they're not real soil yeah, yeah. would you say that the um I would think that the tabletop, you know, that house plants that we've talked about for the most part are the ones that you need to kind of pot up every few years, but that the bigger, you know, the tree ones, it, they do are slower growing, right? In the sense of, you know, like the yes. figs and the Benjaminas and the, the Dracaenas, you know, you, maybe if you've had it like many years, you might need mm. to um upgrade it from like a 10 inch pot to a 12 inch pot but those ones i think it's just important to keep the um soil good and and uh and you know and, and make sure that you know drainage is good and and all of that sure right excellent distinction yeah the little guys that we grow as tabletops or uh you know the things we put on our desk or windowsill whatever yeah they're yeah. they tend to grow much quicker than than our bigger ones that's yeah. right. So yeah, where we were talking about repotting your big rubber plant. Yeah, you might only do that once every two, maybe three years. Right. right. Whereas if I'm potting up, you know, my polka dot plant and it's growing like a weed, that might be, you know, once or twice a year or once, at least once every growing beginning of every season. Growing yeah. Season. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah sure. for sure. For sure. That we yeah. don't want to miss. Yeah. So one of my, um, so Helen has written in, and this is a dilemma I have with my rubber tree plant as well. Is Helen's asking about cleaning the leaves on indoor plants. Dust gets on them and we can't just vacuum them. Um, yeah. yeah, we wish we could, but uh, <laughs> um, so what is the best way? And I, I tend to say I don't really do it often, but uh, yeah. And I know you can buy like a leaf shine, but you don't really need to, do you? No. And that's all synthetic floral safe oil. And you're going to be spraying usually neem oil and you're spraying it yeah. all over the place, um, which actually neem oil is actually toxic to chlorophylls in plants. So if you're overdoing your neem oil sprays, you're actually killing your or damaging your plant, ah. but usually just a distilled uh, or like a bottled water or um, a distilled water, just something that doesn't fill with, uh, you know, chlorine and fluoride salts on a damp cloth and just a quick light little wipe just to kind of mimic the rain every okay. once in a while i'll take my uh christmas cactus or sorry my thanksgiving cactus matthew <laughs> um and it will get dusty because i've kind of got it in like a back corner on the back far back table um, and i will just put it in for its actual water into the shower just a light shower and it'll just kind of do its rain it won't disturb the soil mm -hmm. but it'll help dislodge some of that um mm -hmm. dust and debris yeah. that's been collected around it yeah, so, yeah i think i've heard of other people doing that yeah but put, put especially the big ones yeah put them it's a lot of work to move them but yet it's a yes. lot of work to to touch every single leaf too yes exactly exactly imagine like on your rubber or, or an indoor palm or something like that going for every single leaf for yeah. sure so yeah just a clean saltless water distilled or bottled and just a damp cloth wiping it off just like we would wipe our shelf but with a little bit more specific towards mm -hmm. the water yeah I yeah I think of like those microfiber cloths because I know I've just done it dry yeah, and it doesn't really do much like it just kind of pushes the dust around but mm. yeah so if you dampen it um so Helen I hope that helps we'd love to hear what type of plant you have that you are uh, um struggling with with the dust we love that <laughs> that's right um Irene has also written in uh down the garden path how much sun should my quote move to house plants get and now when taken outside I tried to get six hours of sunlight while the plants are in the house during the winter uh, but now when gearing up to move them outside will too much sun hurt them and that is an excellent question Irene and definitely something we wanted to cover yeah 
we're not ready, or, or you might be ready, depending on where you're listening from, but we don't want to just take our indoor house plants that are tropical in origin and shove them out into full sun. The leaf thickness has grown um, a little thinner for us, and they're going to adapt to the lower light levels inside. So when you just pop them outside, you will sunburn them. So much like us, you know, when we get our first hot sunny day, mm -hmm. we run outside, we're not prepared because we spend inside during the winter and it's like mid April and sunny. And it's like, I've actually got sun on my face mm -hmm. and very similar thing to our plants. We will, you know, tan and look good, uh, but our leafy friends will burn and those leaves will die. And then eventually they will come out. So the trick to do is slowly move them out. So you want to give them either very early morning sun, protected from, I usually say about 10, 30, 11, and again, depending on where you are in the height of summer, about 4.30, um, maybe a little later or, or earlier in the day, like three o'clock, depending on where you are. But just to give them a very low weak light and let them adapt. So they'll take in that light. It won't be enough to burn them. And after about a week or so and a half, maybe two weeks, depending on who it is, you can usually then put her out in the full normal sun. She's fattened mm -hmm. up, she's thickened her leaves, and she's adapted to that high intensity of light for sure. Okay. Yeah. And these are the ones that we've had inside. So if you're buying a new mm -hmm. plant that's at the garden center that's in the center of your summer container or your spring container, they are already uh, accl acclimatized. Thank you. <laughs> That's that word, acclimatized. But it, it, but if you're bringing it in, um, yes, then you need to kind of be slower. Now, should you be giving them more light in the house? Like, let's say, like mine have been, you know, it's just, it's not as question of sun. It's just a question of where I've got a spot, right? Yeah. So should you be now trying to get them more light in preparing them to go outside? Definitely. If you've got some low light, you're, you had a plant outside and a low light spot was the only spot to put it. Yeah, you could definitely start moving it within, uh, you know, six feet of a south or a west window or just adjacent to the window where you get a very bright, high indirect light. Okay. For sure. I wouldn't put them right in the south window where they're going to get, or the west yeah. window where they get sun all day, but adjacent would be good for sure. Okay. Certainly. Yeah, I'd love to see what you're bringing back outside, Irene. So that's uh, that's cool. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear about that. Uh, what is in everybody's plant collection? I know, I yes. know. So thank you, everybody, for joining us here live on Reality Radio 101. I'm Matthew Dressing here with my co-host and co-author, Joanne Shaw, and you're listening to Down the Garden Path. Joanne and I enjoy hosting Down the Garden Path each week bringing you interesting and relevant topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from our research and from the guests that join us here on the show. Don't forget you can spend more time with us down the garden path. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Down the Garden Path Podcast is our handle there. You can also find us on your favorite podcast providers. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button, please, to be notified of new content. Please don't forget to like, share, and leave us a comment. We love hearing from you. You can always write us here, down the garden path of podcast at hotmail.com, or you can check us out on our websites. Joanne can be found at www.down2earth.ca, and you can find myself at www.naturalaffinity.ca. So we are talking all about houseplants. I think we've got a few more listener questions uh, popping in here. Uh, Tom has written in and says, always love the advice from Matt and Joanne. Uh, plus, I love to hear my own name over the air. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Tom. <laughs> hey, Tom. <laughs> We're bringing our plants outside for a long winter. Should we do it gradually? Uh, like the day, a day here and day there before we put them outside for the entire summer. What about shock to the plant? So, yeah, I think um, we were just saying um, uh, with similar Irene, to Irene's how much question. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So very similar. Yeah. So, Tom, you don't have to go to the point where you're putting them out and bringing them in. But you do bring up a good point. If you are doing it and we do get a cold snap where we're dropping below uh, tropical winter, which is about 16 degrees Celsius, we don't want to leave them outside overnight. As long as it's above 16 degrees overnight, 
They should be safe. That's where tropical winter kind of belongs. And remember, they've been inside all winter like you have, right? So they haven't seen anything less than maybe, you know, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and I apologize for all of our American listeners. I still have it memorized what that is in Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, you watch out for overnight, though, just for in case we get a cold snap. Much like we're hardening off our little seedlings or our new young... Uh, vegetable or flower starts right but out in the day but we do want to bring those in so they don't burn away mm -hmm. yeah anything else pop into mind that you've seen that has been super popular i mean you know we talked about cacti and succulents yes um, the monsteras are you still finding that as the trend yes that's the trend and the hanging because i think like the whole macrame trend or the whole pot yeah, like hanging from like a uh, whether it's yarn or or a, or a kind of a string or you know um, that type of thing, I think there's and some pots are even like built into like the the, the hanger is built into the pot. Yes. So things like um, string of pearls and string of um, or it's, is it the goldfish plant? You know those type of they're they're very succulent looking. They look yeah. like a chain of peas, like the string of pearls. You know they look like green peas, right? And it's very it they're does. very struck succulent um and uh yeah so those i feel are are i think it's because people are like the pot is in style so then now you know i mean the, the decorating them i've seen them on pinterest you know hanging on hooks on your like curtain rods and and hanging um you know the the plants from like the uh, an s hook off your curtain rod so you have things in the window and that's great for people one who's short on space and two who's short on light because you yeah. might as well like why put you might as well like put it right at the window you know i've been tempted to do that myself um so yeah so i think those have been popular in conjunction with like even the macrame trend right so just by the Definitely. very nature of the macrame plant and the hanging things are in trend. So then now plants are going in them, right? Yeah. Yeah. The other things that I've seen too are um, I've seen things like peace lilies and spider plants starting to kind of pick back up again oh, to okay. kind of stand by reliable ones. Yep. But I've also seen, you know, especially amongst my students, things with very colorful foliage mm -hmm. are still very hot. So yeah. Um, yeah, I, I always think of things like the Tradescantia or inch plants, uh, all the different pothos, um, things like the bigger philodendrons like McCall's Finale or Red Point where they have the big broad arrowhead leaves. Yes. These are also super popular as well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you were pointing out um, last week's show, the pepper, because I was loving the, on those pepperomias. Yes, and they come and they almost remind me. You know what they do remind me of now that I think back. It's almost when you saw the whole table of them. It's almost like uh, coral bells or heuchera outside, yes. right? Because they, you know, they've got the ones that are dark foliage with a bit of variegation. They've got the ones that are, you know, um, burgundy, more burgundy, like like you know, it very much so. So they're very, they're a very nice plant. I have a nice, um, just green glossy one uh in my kitchen on the counter and Ooh. i think because i now have like under count out now because it's nowhere near a window but because i have the under counter uh light it's doing great nice it almost like it is so green and happy that it almost looks like a fake plant like it <laughs> it really does you know so you know yes. you know you've got a good plant when you passes as a fake plant <laughs> <laughs> so true oh, that's right that's right Watering and feeding is another thing that's going to yeah. slowly change as we get into spring. Okay. So as we said, um, you know, our, our house plants are realizing the days are growing longer. They're starting to show signs of some new growth. Um, I think almost everything of mine is. And I do have some more in like an east and a, a no, I'm, yeah, east, east, north, northeast kind of window. Um, so they haven't really been doing too much for me, but now that you know, over the last couple of weeks, I've noticed a lot of good burst on them. Like I was saying, my Thanksgiving cactus is starting to pop up some blooms and some new growth. So this means that their uh, need for food and water are going to slowly increase. Okay. So where things may have been taking a while to dry out with higher light levels, longer days, depending on where you've got them, you might see some increased feeding okay. and some watering. Always check your watering. Remember, it's easier, better to underwater than to overwater because you can't yes. really wring out that soil without damaging that root. And as far as feeding goes, and I actually have not looked 
to see when the exact date is. But when is Easter this year? Uh, um, the 9th. The 9th of April. Okay, yeah. it is a little later. I usually will say my kind of rhyme is from Easter to Thanksgiving. And when I say Thanksgiving, I'm thinking Canadian Thanksgiving because it's October. And right. the days are definitely so kind of like April to October. So April to October, exactly. Uh, you know, we can basically feed it once every two weeks. Okay. Uh, it's like a synthetic fertilizer. And yeah, so I was just going to ask you, what are we feeding it with? Yeah, so we can do just a regular, I always use Schultz Indoor House Plants uh, fertilizer, the 101510. And I'm going to do it basically once every two weeks for my house plants uh, from April to October. And then October through the cooler seasons to uh, April, I'm going to just do it once a month or once every uh, six weeks because they're okay. not going to be as heavily feeding or as actively growing. Mm -hmm. But as we get going, we are going to see more growth. So more food and water. Okay. More food and water. Now, a couple of questions about, about food. So one, my first question is, um, nowadays when you go to buy, like, so if we're telling, you know, our listeners to get new potting soil or, you know, um, for their pot, for their plants to pot them up or, or to refresh them, many potting mixes now say they come with either a mycorrhizae or some kind of a diluted fertilizer uh is one is that a good thing and two does that mean we don't have to fertilize the mycorrhizae i'm still kind of out on the fence about in the soil because okay. i think like pro mix is probably the most popular one to do that but i've heard mixed results but i've also read different studies that have said that the mycorrhizal, they a they may not you know bond to everything because they can be mm -hmm. very specific, but then just the way we treat it in the soils, um, and they're mass produced, etc. They almost don't survive the packaging thing. So okay. I'm not too sure. So for as far as mycorrhizal, because they will definitely help reduce your watering, find all of those smaller uh, food particles or those elements in the deep, deep, fine crevices of all of those. Uh, all the soil particulate that normal roots won't really get to. So okay. I'm all for that for sure. Um, but I don't know how it is with soil. So I'll have to do some experiments. If you've done some experiments, I'd love to hear down the garden path podcast at uh, hotmail.com. Let me know what your experience has been with your mycorrhizal enhanced potting soil. Okay. Um, for indoor so plants. I can really see the yeah. benefit of them out for our outside plants. Like, you know, we've had re rescue on, we've talked yeah. about different, products so I definitely see it for outside I, I just don't know why they've switched to be to try them on the inside um and then I, I know some people kind of swear by that compost tea where yep. it's basically like a you know like a tea bag but it's kind of like an like a manure tea bag um some people with composters can kind of make their own and uh, or you can literally buy it. it looks like a you have to be careful where you store it so nobody makes tea out of it but uh <laughs> You know, and I've done that in the past. I haven't done that in many, many years, but I think I, you know, um, so, but there it's a little trickier because you don't know what the plants are getting. Like when you, like you said, with Schultz, you know, you're getting 15, 10, yeah. or, you know, or you're getting 20, 20, 20, like, you know, that type of thing. So that's a bit safer. It's probably, especially for beginners. For sure. Yeah, I know you're right. Um, I think it's definitely safer. Even if going like an organic based fertilizer, like a kelp meal or, uh, you know, you can get liquid. I always use the musky 511 from uh, Green Earth type of thing. Compost teas can be variable because, yeah, like you said, what is the quality of the components going into your compost in the first place? Do you then use a nutrient analysis before you apply them or make the tea? Uh, because do, are you applying the right nutrients? Mm -hmm. What's gotten into your pile? Are you using it from outside, inside? What's going in? Then you have root pathogens or other soil-borne diseases that might be mixed in. So when you're watering the tea, you don't know what your formulation is going to be. Right. I can get it though. I, I do get it though from, for example, like the microorganisms in the tea, right? You're going to have the beneficial bacteria and the fungal spores mm -hmm. that may not be activated. They're not going to hurt. Like it's not going to be gonna harmful. Hurt. Right. They're not going to hurt. Right. So they're going to be present. But again, the thing with the, uh, we've found um, from Bob and Root Rescue, right? Is that if you start fertilizing with anything that's non organic, those mycorrhizal shut down because they don't have that. Um, symbiotic relationship they're not hunting for food for the plant and the plant's not rewarding them with carbohydrates 
So they turn off the second you start using like a Schultz or a Miracle Grow. Right. Or something okay. Like that. So it's all or all or like. Right. So if you are going organic and you're doing mycorrhizal beneficial bacteria, you want to make sure you're feeding that to then feed the plant because it's that relationship versus okay. just the synthetic. Okay. Um, but yeah. So the teas, I've never done it. I th- to me, it seems like a lot of work. Um, yeah. To make the tea, to hold the thing, to count yeah. How long? Do, how long do you soak it for? Like right. it's yeah. It's when, like do I eat like because hot tea? Like am I gonna boil it? And like yes, I mean it's true. I'd love to know if any of our listeners use it. Um, you know, and I know when I've done it in the past, and then I I had like a little blue watering can with a tiny hole and put the tea bag in, and then it's like I don't know, is it soaked long enough? Is it should I yeah. you know? So yeah, I I agree that it's a little tricky, but you you do kind of still see it around, so. Definitely. Um, but and, it is easier to use the dropper, use the shulk. Yeah. Right? Right. Or, yeah, or, you know, measure out your pre, you know, exactly what you're getting in an organic mix, like your musky 511 fertilizer. Type okay. Of yeah. Okay. And I'm not denying that, you know, compost teas don't have any uh, value to them or no nutrients because that's what compost is rich with. Right. I just question the true, like, this is the result I'm actually getting. And then are you treating the plant and the soil correctly afterwards? But mm-hmm. again, I, I don't do it. So, but it's very yeah. interesting. And the reading yeah. is on both sides. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. And it, the, 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 um, just the, like outside, like a, a 15, 15, 15 is fine. Right. Cause I know, cause it does get tricky, right? You get the Schultz for African violets or Schultz for cactus and succulent. Like, you know, they get very specific, but yet if you're, if you look at the numbers, they probably aren't that much different. Yeah, I think it, like things you typically get you know, like 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20, 10, 15, 10. Yeah, because yeah. Um, you can't have a fertilizer for every single plant you have. Like you've got to have something, right? No, right. And the, the your African violet and your succulents, they are slightly off with numbers. I think it's like 864 for African violet usually. Um, and then 277 usually for like a cactus. Okay. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I've even used my orchid fertilizer for normal plants because they needed some food. I yeah. knew that they were missing something, so I did it. And you know what? When in doubt, I mean, always read the package, read the instructions. Um, plants are smart. They're going to not take in what they don't really need. They're going to oh, be good. able to search for it. And yeah. then, you know, if you've got something that you know will work, but it says rose, for example, remember that plants can't read. They don't know that you're giving them rose Rose. fertilizer. (laughs) Right. They're going to, oh, the nutrients are there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'll take what I need and and get rid of the rest. Exactly. Okay. So that is good. I think we did have a um, bump, 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 Tim. Uh, he's asking for laser. Since we're just talking about fertilizer right now, says when we move our house plant outdoors, I'm amazed at how many people are moving their stuff outside. Should we feed them with any type of fertilizer or should we wait? Uh, so that we don't don't shock, shock or over fertilize them. Thanks for your advice. Yeah, yeah. People are dying to get their plants outside. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't wait either. Uh, <laughs> I am waiting to get out there. Anyways, yeah. Um, no, good question, Tim. As long as again, she's going to be actively growing when she's inside with you. So again, just more so watching that light. She is going to be still feeding and actively growing, knowing that the intensity is increased. The days are longer, so you should be able to keep them on their regular fertilizer schedule. If you are worried about shock or something shows up, eliminate any pest issues or Mm -hmm. like, you know, a cold night or something like that. Um, But you can always reduce it by half. So you can always, you know, if it's 10 milliliters per liter of water or, you know, uh, I'm sorry, guys, again, whatever the imperial equivalent is, you know, just cut that recommended rate by half. And then, and can, you can continue to fertilize it and, and she should be okay. She should, adapt. Okay. but then she does have the food available if she needs to repair mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we covered, um, fertilizing. I yeah. do want to, and I know we mentioned a bit of propagating, um, but I also, in the sense of you, you know, taking root cuttings or, or, um, what did you, what else did you cut it? Root cuttings or, um, air layering air layering um but that's one type of thing too like like i said with my pathos i had gotten a bit leggy so that is another thing we can kind of do right when now right now is see if you need to um to trim something and make new plants uh water to me like so there's so many plants where you just kind of take take it uh the stem and trim it and then put it in water 
Yeah, exactly. For it to root, right? Yep. And that's kind of what's happening when you do cutting in soil too, right? But mm. your water is, is your medium for sure. Just know though that when you have like an ivy or a pothos or something that's rooted in water, they have adapted to that high level of water. So when you do move it, if you do end up potting it up, for example, mm -hmm. they do want a little bit of a higher level of water to start with. You okay. don't want to be able to dry out because that will just shock them right out. Okay. That'll just knock all guilty. that progress away. Yeah. Yeah. Guilty yeah. So of kind that of kind of thing. Keep them wet and then just slowly ease back as they kind of adapt, but don't let them dry out. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. And then just make sure that you're changing the water as well, right? The water mm. can become stale um, yeah. and just kind of get cloudy and bacteria starts to grow from in the pot and off of the roots. So yeah. changing your water regularly. And checking the water because um, yeah. I've got some that are like, usually people have a clear, like it's a clear vase or a clear container so you can, you know, eyeball it. But I've got some that are in like these little black kind of matching containers. And then, you know, and I, I periodically, you know, you can just touch them and know. And then sometimes it's like, uh oh, there's no more water left in here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so yeah. So I think when you're doing that and, and I've always wondered about those little, they're kind of decorative. They almost look like um, more like chemistry, you know, bottles. Like they're kind of like usually on like a metal frame or a wood frame for sitting on a desktop. And they're like, almost like reminds me of like test tubes, right. Or something yes. like that. And it honestly, I think they would be a cool thing. Like if you're cutting if you, especially if you've got a lot of plants that are hanging plants that you can propagate um like uh like you know any of the ones that we talked about right where you can you can root them in and that almost becomes like a conversation piece or i think it'd be a great gift too agreed yeah i think it's really mm -hmm. neat seeing all them yeah. and everything yeah being cutted. yeah 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 you can sure. often find those at home sense and and i think a lot of people don't even know what they are so yeah so anytime you you see like a wire frame with a whole bunch of test tubes attached to them um then that makes it great you can like they can be used as bud vases if you wanted to do that but you could also um you know propagate your plants in that so yeah uh, so that's a great a great tip so yeah so i think um people don't realize that if you've got a really happy plant even spider plant right when it's starting to have all those baby plants you yep. you don't realize it, how many more plants you can get from your your existing plants that's right exactly you, lots of plants getting uh, sections of your christmas cactus and thanksgiving cactus mm -hmm. if you leave your orchids the flowering stock will often create a little clone that you can little grow roots and then take it off. Mm -hmm. Lots of ways to make more plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. And spring is a good time. I mean, you can root any time of the year, but I think sp spring, that is one thing that I think they're, because they're more keen to get growing, right? Yeah. Sp as, again, the, as they notice the days are longer, they start to gear up and start to grow. So they're very vigorous versus, you know, mid to end of summer, they've kind of done their thing they've slowed down their all their processes and they're just kind of waiting it out or doing their thing as they go so yeah when the act growth is actively growing and greening and dividing that's the best best time to do it when we get outside for trees and shrubs and things like that you know the different types of wood the softwood the semi-hardwood the hardwood that becomes a different time game that becomes a different time game. But for inside, usually spring as they start to actively grow. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And let's talk about some. So I know we've got our upcoming, um, we were going to kind of fold in our stepping stones to still talk about houseplants, but some of the um, dilemmas that we get into. So which ties into some of the questions we've gotten. So um, bum, bum, I'm looking here. Someone talked about, oh, Grace was talking about really enjoying the show tonight. My houseplant leaves have turned yellow. Should I try to repair the damage, if that is damage, before bringing them outdoors? Thank you. Another person who brings hers outdoors. So, yeah. So, if you've got some issues with leaves, um, depends on the plant, Grace, if you want to let us know what plant you have. But yellow leaves, there's no really rescuing them, right? It's mostly like take it off. If they go completely yellow and they just kind of go limp, yeah, she's usually like abandoning those leaves. Mm. If they're... If they're in the top or bottom, it might also be a nutrient deficiency. But again, depending on what plant it is, because different plants will exhibit um, in different ways. And the placement of that yellowing leaf will also, um, like if it's the top or the bottom, will also tell you what nutrient the plant is or isn't missing. So yeah, okay. check that. A lot of the common times too, Grace, is sometimes, and again, I'm not saying that you're doing this, um, but most people um, 
will kill their plants with love. So sometimes if you're just overwatering it, or maybe you didn't actually overwater it, you gave it the same water, but maybe it was kind of just kind of in the evergreen sleep mode because it was a shorter day and she's just kind of telling you that she's abandoning a leaf, a lower leaf. Okay. Or same thing if she's just over dried a little bit of time, she diverted power from that leaf to support the others. But if you want to send us a picture to the same uh, address, we'd be love to, you know, take a look at it and see if we yeah. see any effects or if it's a nutrient deficiency. That'd be fun. For sure. And so Ray's also, so the other thing is pests. So Ray has yes Joanne yes no yellow flowers Ray in the garden uh what about reverse pets <laughs> if we picked up any house pets like mites fleas bed bugs etc should we spray or treat the plants before we bring them outside thank you if you get some of the weird ones uh Ray like you were mentioning like fleas or bed bugs or that sort of thing you you might kind of treat them I'm kind of thinking more of with like a diatomaceous earth or a pyrethrin based spray, but they will usually have specific spots in which they like to be and to hide. Mites are definitely lots of mite species that will attack our plants. Um, things like fleas uh, and bed bugs, they're blood suckers. So they're going to be close to where you're like you're sleeping or your pet's hair or fur or where they're sleeping. So they don't usually go after the plants overly but you will get other there's lots of other pests that will attack yeah okay. but worth a worth a check especially if they're like a you have a house plant that's right there and mm -hmm. for example you know you have bed bugs i would probably take a close look around there because they might be hiding under the crevices of the pot or you know in the palm or underneath the edge so definitely okay. worth if it's nearby yeah <laughs> I love this for the mites and the fly. I love the sticky traps. They seem yes. to work. I mean, it's, you hate seeing the little piece of yellow. I've got that right now and like dead plants stuck to, dead bugs stuck to the, <laughs> to, uh, to it. But uh, it definitely does work and it, it catches them adults and prevents them. Um, not only does it kill them, but it prevents them from laying their eggs. So it can be very effective. Um, uh, Jim, Jim is very organized and he has a, a great watering schedule for his plants um, and, uh, so that is good. I, <laughs> I struggle with that, but I, it's funny what you were saying, because I do notice, I feel like I'm watering much more often in the last couple of weeks. So, or that I've watered and then I'm like going, oh my gosh, they're still, uh, they're still dry. Um, and on that note, the, for my, my little stepping stone idea for a trick was, especially if you're going away or if you are a neglectful plant parent, like I am, <laughs> um, I was showing Matt how I, when I purchased my delicately beautiful, um, tiny little African violet, it came with a wick. So you can, especially if you're potting something up, right, Matt, you can put like a piece of yarn, that's all it is, is a piece of yarn mm. in the soil that goes through the hole in the pot. And this is especially good if you are putting that like the plastic container that it comes with into a more decorative pot or decorative container. So what you and so what I, I would say, what is that two inches? Yeah, probably that's about two it, inches yeah. or so. And um, um, so what they've done is they've put it in the soil and it's actually quite top the top of the plant. I was surprised and poked it through one of the holes in the plastic pot and it's two inches down. So then I have it in this nice little glass, um, you know, urn shaped uh, container oh, yeah. that I can put water. So the plant never goes, I've always had a tar time. I love these pots, but the pot is never narrow enough to go all the way to the bottom. Right. So I can fill that with water and then the wick will take up just as much as the plant needs. And I think you can do that with other plants as well. Or if you're going away, um, you know, having that wick in there can, you, you know, help you maybe like nine times of the year, or most of the year, you, it doesn't matter, right? You're watering normally, but you know, sometimes you, if you have a lot of plants and you're going away in the summer, you can put them in the bathtub, right? And put an inch of water and they've got the wick, that type of thing. Um, what do you think? Is that a good idea? Yeah, and I think you you hit the key there with great for for being away, um, and then just the way you had your plant in that little uh, vase or urn, you never want to set the bottom of the plant and the wick together in the source of water. Okay, right. Yeah, you always want so that. Not the bathtub. Yes. As soon as I said that, I was like, no, no. I think that would be if oh, you I, didn't have the wick. But I sorry. Yeah, I think yes. I totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but yeah, because sometimes you have totally like really cool, because that happens a lot, right? Like you've got really nice, interesting pots or a container mm. that isn't your typical container, but then the, but then, 
watering it is tricky because of um, that shape. So doing something like that, where you can, you can do the, um, the, do the yarn. And, you know, again, I think it's like a cool, especially if you're potting up smaller things or you brought them home from the nursery and or the garden center or whatever, and you want to um, do something like that, then I think it, it can be very helpful. Yeah. And like you said, it's simple, like a piece of yarn. If you've mm-hmm. got some bigger pots, um, you know, other absorbent fabrics like old washcloths, for example, mm. you can cut them into strips and there's yep. a whole pile of little ones, um, a nice worn washcloth. Yeah. yeah. And I've done the same thing with a sink. You know, I've taken away my dish uh, tray, the tray that holds my dishes, but I leave the, the drip mat down and then I put a towel across the whole drip mat and then the drip or the towel goes into a filled sink and then the plants just slowly wick it up as long as those holes in the pot uh, or the wick is again in contact with that water source. Yeah, and it's yeah. Cool. It pulls it up. Yeah. So lots of cool yeah. ways to make them self-watering. And especially um, good for plants like the African violet that doesn't necessarily like water on its leaves, right? Yes. And I'm yes. sure you know of a few other plants like that. So this is a, a good way of, um, or likes to be top watered. So many, there's several things that like to be watered uh, more from the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would even work okay with orchids because yep. they don't want to be sitting in a lot of water and you, I, I end up taking mine to the sink and, and soaking them in the sink and then taking them out and putting them back, you know, but sometimes you can't do that. So, uh, so yeah. So anybody who's got curious about a trick, a time-saving trick, um, especially for your indoor plants, when you're now out focus outside, many of our listeners are yeah. you know, lo- taking their plants outside and we're outside in the garden and our, uh, our little ones, uh, our inside ones get forgotten a bit. I like it if you have someone coming over to help water your plants, then they don't have to water anything. They just have to fill up the reservoir and walk away. Don't have to yeah. worry about the best somebody else out. killing your plants. Yes. Exactly. yes. Uh, so another great show with lots of answers, lots of questions um about house plants that's right so hopefully some spring care tips to get you started that's keep right. in mind as things get active um and next week i'm excited that we have dawn uh, we haven't had her in a few years from gardens yeah. plus on the show so we are going to be talking about uh outside plants next week everybody to get you kind of dreaming and scheming um <laughs> so easy she specializes in uh, easy care perennials And I'm looking forward to her joining us on the show. Me too. So we'll see you same time. Thank you again for joining us all here. On YouTube too. On YouTube as well. (laughs) As well as down the garden path on Reality Radio 101. Take care, everyone. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path. With your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.